gain some truths from the Bible tonight. And in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Now, this is kind of a different kind of a sermon. See, the way that we usually have things set up here is Sunday morning is usually the kind of the preaching. That's the yelling and screaming kind of preaching service. And then, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And then Sunday night is usually more of a... Um, Either, either a teaching time where you can learn some good Bible doctrine, learn some truths out of the Bible. Sometimes it's more of an encouraging time where we preach more of a positive type sermon and an uplifting type sermon. You're thinking, man, where was I? It was when you were gone. <laughs> it was the time that you were gone. That's what we did on Sunday night. Don't miss it next time. Anyway, um, and then other times it's just sermons that don't really fit anywhere else, you know, Sunday night's a great time to preach. And then Wednesday night, of course, where we study the Bible, and that's more of a preaching time also on Wednesday nights, is, is more preaching. But tonight's topic is kind of an odd topic, and I want to show you something from the Bible. I wasn't really satisfied with my outline. I was going through and trying to make an outline of this, and trying to organize my thoughts, because the sermon's all really about one thing. But there's just so many different aspects of this monster. This monster has many different heads all over. And so I was trying to tie it all together and, and put it into one sermon. But I want to preach against the subject of communism. And you say, what? Communism? You say, I come to church and hear a sermon against communism? Come on, Pastor Anderson, this is 2006. This isn't the 1960s. This isn't the 1970s. Oh, you're going to see in the sermon... If this is something that we are faced with right now, something that's always creeping in, this philosophy, and maybe it's a little different aspect of communism that you thought of that, 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 than we're preaching on tonight. And then the other thing is, just even in our personal lives and in our churches, these philosophies can creep in, these humanistic, worldly, ungodly philosophies can creep in. So, what's wrong with communism, and how does it affect us? Well, if you would, turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. Now the first thing I want to tell you about this, and, and again, Sunday night is, a lot of people just come to church on Sunday morning because it's tradition. You know, it's just something that they do, they get up, they go to church, they mark it off that they went to church on Sunday morning. And usually Sunday night is going to be a more serious crowd. I mean, it's people that have not only gone on Sunday morning, but they've come back on Sunday night. They're a little more serious about their Christianity. They're not just a Sunday morning only Christian who just shows up because it's their duty. You know, they want to learn about the things of God. They love God. They're back on Sunday night for more. Boy, they're back on Wednesday night because they want to learn the Word of God because they want to grow in the things of God. And so, on Sunday night, it's a little more of an advanced type sermon. So I hope you understand that. But in Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 23. The Bible says here, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, here's what I want to tell you, number one. God is against this getting everybody together kind of a mentality. That's what communism is. You say, I thought communism was Stalin. Look, communism comes from the word commune. That's where we all live together. It's where we all get together and join up and join hands and sing kumbaya. And we're all united and together with one another. Now, in the story that we read in... The book of Genesis chapter 11, we read about the Tower of Babel. Man has just gotten off the ark. You've got Noah and Noah's wife. You've got their three sons and their wives. So you basically have eight people getting off the ark. God says to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And he tells them that he wants them to overspread the earth. He wants them to fill up the earth. What do they do? They say, here's what we're going to do. We don't want to be scattered across the earth. We don't want to be split up. We all want to be together, we want to join together. And they say... That's what we're going to do. We're going to build a city, and we're going to build a tower to keep us from being spread out. We're going to form a system here where it's all just self-contained here, and we're all joined together into one system. Well, God looked down at that, and he said, look what they're doing. He said, nothing's going to be withholding them. They're all united against us. They're trying to build a tower to heaven. They're trying to make their own way to heaven. And by the way, that's exactly what religion is doing today. That's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church is doing. They say, uh, you can work your way to heaven. You can make your own way to heaven. It's not the blood of Jesus Christ. It's confessing your sins. It's being baptized. It's the sacraments. It's uh, the church. It's being a good person. You ask a Roman Catholic, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? They usually say, well, I hope so. I'm trying. That's the most, or they say, well, nobody can know that. Because they're trying. See that? They're trying. Look at the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse number 30. He said, what must I do to be saved? 
Because that's what the world thinks. They think you have to do something to be saved. They think it's by living a good life or giving up some sin or uh, turning your life over to Christ and putting Him in the driver's seat and all these different nomenclature that they use. But it's all the same. It's all man trying to build his own way to heaven. God said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the way to heaven, but man is always trying to make their own way to heaven. The Bible's way... What must I do to be saved? You don't have to do anything. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You see, it's already been done. That's why God said on the cross, it is finished. It's done. You have to do anything. You have to build some tower to get to heaven. He said, that's ridiculous. Somebody actually thinks they could build a tower to get to heaven? I mean, good night. Heaven is billions of light years away. But it's no more ridiculous than the man who thinks he's going to make his own way to heaven. By his little church or his little good life, his religion. No, Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. It's not through a church. It's not through your good works. It's not through anything you do. It's through the done. It's through Jesus Christ. But that's what they're doing in this, in this story. And so God says, here's what I'm going to do. In chapter 10, I already said I want to divide up families. That's what he said. He said, I want to divide people up into families. And then he said, I'm going to further divide them up into nations. If you saw that in, in Genesis chapter 10 at the end. He said, I'm dividing family from family. I'm dividing nation from nation. I want there to be separate nations. I want there to be separate families. Well, the devil is interested in getting people together. Why? Well, here's why. Take the local church. There are three institutions that God started. In Genesis chapter 10, you'll see he instituted families and nations. In the New Testament, he instituted what's called the local church. Those are God's three institutions. Now, the local church, as you're looking at there in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says the head of the church is Christ. The Bible says the church is subject unto Christ. Now, what is a church? Well, very simple. All you have to do is let the Bible define itself. In the Old Testament, there's a word used called congregation. Congregation is where people congregate. It's where people get together. It's an assembly of people. That's the word that's used in the Old Testament three times. That word congregation is quoted in the New Testament. And God substitutes the word church. He never used the word congregation in the New Testament. That's why in Psalm 22, 22, the Bible says, In the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. And in Hebrews 2.17 it says, In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now does God know how to quote himself accurately? I believe so. So... A church and a congregation must be the same thing. Because otherwise God wouldn't substitute the words there like that three times in the New Testament. And so we know that a church is not a building. It's not some fancy cathedral somewhere. It's not some big organization like the Roman Catholic Church or like the United Methodist denomination, these big denominations. No, a church is an assembly, a congregation of people like we have right here. A congregation of people. A local congregation of believers. Well... Who's in charge of this church right here? Who's in charge? Jesus Christ is supposed to be in charge. This church has one head, Jesus Christ. This church has one authority, Jesus Christ. This is the Word right here. You know, In the beginning is the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was God. This Bible, Jesus Christ, is the authority in this church. Now, if, should somebody in some other city somewhere, running some big organization, some big denomination, be telling us what to do as a church? Telling us what to preach? Telling us what we can believe? Telling us what to do? No. Because we are non-denominational. We are independent Baptists. Why are we independent Baptists? Why are we not part of a denomination? Because we just believe that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and we don't want some man usurping Jesus Christ's authority. Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, the Bible says, and then he's put pastors and stuff as under-shepherds just to carry out uh, and preach what he told them to preach. Not what some, you know, some uh, professor in some university wants me to preach or something like that. I'm supposed to preach what God wants me to preach. So we see that Christ is the head of the church. Well, here's the thing. The devil wants nothing more but to destroy nations, destroy churches, and destroy families. So here's what he does. He can't go individually. See, he's not omnipresent. Let me show you that. I'll read this for you. You don't have to turn there. Job 2.2 2 says, And the Lord said unto Satan... From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. He said, I've been going all over earth. I've been walking around. He's not everywhere at once. He has to travel around. Look in, uh, or let me just read this for you. You'll see the same thing in 1 Peter 5.8. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, 
walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So the devil's going around with his minions trying to find somebody that they can destroy. Trying to destroy a church. Trying to destroy a nation. Trying to destroy a family. Well, that's too much work. He's not going to be able to do that. So here's what he does. He wants to get people grouped together. And if he can get people grouped together, all he has to do is just destroy it from the top down. And all his garbage will filter down. Let me give an example. Denomination. Let's take the Methodists. Okay. And no, I don't mind naming names. Unlike the Bible, which names a lot of names and individual people's names. Like people like Hymenaeus, Phygelus, Hermogenes, Diotrephes. Men who the Bible maligns and said, this is a bad preacher. Let me tell you about him. And how do I know those names? Well, because the Bible names them. People that were in Paul's day and Peter's day that were wrong. Well, the Methodists. You, you go back to the Methodists, and they've never believed the gospel, by the way, because they always believe you can lose your salvation. But you go way back to the Methodists, and, boy, they had the hymns, right? I mean, they were preaching the King James Bible. They had standards and all that kind of stuff. And they had uh, a lot of doctrine and so forth. But here's what happened. They're all linked up together, right? It's called the United Methodist Church. So what does the devil do? The devil attacks that denomination, that head. And pretty soon, he can screw up every single church in the United Methodist movement. Because they're all tied together. If the one goes down, they all go down. I have a, I have a, a guy that I work with. Fire alarm guy. And uh, he supplies me with a lot of parts. And I talked to him and he said he's in the United Methodist Church. And I was talking to him and he was telling me just how he was against the homosexuals. I mean, he knew the Bible and he knew that the homosexuals were wrong, that it was an abomination. But he said, you know, the United Methodist Church... 10% of their pastors are homosexuals. 50% are female, 50% are male, and 10% are homosexuals. And, and so they just openly are accepting of gays and, and lesbians. And so, he doesn't believe that. But his church is forced to bow down to that. Because if they stood up, just imagine, that United Methodist preacher comes out with his skirt on that they wear. He comes out in his dress and, uh, and gets up and says, Boy, the queers are taking over America! Boy, you turn on the television, you have to look at these filthy sodomites! Boy, you think he'd still be a United Methodist pastor the next week? No, because that church isn't subject to Christ. That church is subject to the United Methodist Church. Oh, boy, I was totally off subject, but let me throw this in. I was in, uh, I was in California, and I was driving from Sacramento into San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco. And I, sorry about that, I have a speech impediment. And I was driving down in there, and there's these giant oversized billboards. I don't know if you've ever been to San Francisco or Chicago. I haven't seen these in Phoenix. But in San Francisco and Chicago, there are oversized billboards. Who's ever seen those? I mean, a billboard that's like eight times as big as a normal billboard, ten times as big. Giant billboards. I get in the car, I'm driving down the expressway, I'm driving down the freeway, and there's a giant picture of, of a sodomite. Okay, huge picture of this gay guy with a sick, perverted, queer little look on his face. And, I, and it says, uh, gay.com is what it's advertising. And it just says, are you gay? And he's just like, hmm? And he's looking at you. Per and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? So I'm supposed to drive down the road with my little toddler in the car seat, and he's supposed to look up at some filthy sodomite? Ugh. That's, where the, uh, that's what's going on in this country. You want to talk about freedom. Where's my freedom to not be exposed to filth everywhere I look? But anyway, that's totally off subject. But the point is, the point is the devil, he has destroyed the United Methodist Church. Whatever it was, he really destroyed it. Uh, look at Baptist denomination, the Southern Baptists. They used to be preaching the gospel. They used to be on fire for God. What happened? They're all joined together, filtered down from the top. The top went corrupt, and then all the other ones filtered down, and they don't want to lose their pension, they don't want to lose their 401k, these pastors, and so they're forced to drink the Kool-Aid, they have to bow down and, and, uh, and worship the golden calf that Aaron set up at the you know, headquarters of the Southern Baptist movement. And so, that's what God wants to do. He wants churches to yoke up. That's why this church is independent. That's why every scriptural church is independent. That's why there's hundreds and thousands of independent Baptist churches across America and across the world, hundreds and thousands of them, the devil can't stop us. Because we're independent. He'd have to come to each individual church and destroy it. So the devil doesn't like that. Well, he wants to get us in a denomination. If he can't get us in a denomination, he wants to get us yoked up with these uh, Bible colleges. Now, a lot of times Bible colleges, you know what they do? We all send our kids to the same Bible college, right? And they all learn the same garbage in many cases. Yes, that's true. Because think back to the 1970s. 
Bob Jones University. Non-denominational, not a Baptist college, never was a Baptist college, and what did all the independent Baptist churches send all their kids to Bob Jones University and they came out a bunch of screwed up heretics that don't believe the Bible. Because God just attacks Bob, or I mean the devil attacks Bob Jones University, filters out to churches all over America. I remember my, my, the man who uh, won my parents to the Lord, Dr. Roland Rasmussen, independent Baptist in Canoga Park, has a big church there. He said, I was so brainwashed at Bob Jones University, it took me 20 years to believe that the King James Bible was the Word of God from the time I came out of there because they brainwashed me so much. And so you'll see Bible colleges in America right now, 2006, going liberal. And then what happens? All the pastors they're putting out are liberal. And then what happens? The whole nation is going liberal. Look at the music in this country. Look at the music in churches from when I was coming up to where it is now. You know what it's like when I was coming up? Exactly what we just sang. That's what it was like. It was like congregational singing of the hymns. That's what we had for music. Just like God is all for these songs that we've been, they've been good enough for the last several hundred years. God ordained congregational singing in the Bible. We've had, we've had whole sermons on that. But here's what happens now. We sit down in the audience and we watch some girl strut up there and she gets up there and performs for everybody. And, oh, oh, and then we all clap because it was just so, oh, so talented. And it's like going to a Las Vegas nightclub. And this is the kind of music that we sing in this church. We sing like, uh, To God be the glory, great things He hath done. That's the way I grew up with music. Now, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church across America, and I'm speaking from first-hand experience, this is the kind of songs you hear. And this is what I heard recently. Men who have compassion, who laugh and love and cry. I mean, that's, that's literally how it was sung. That's the song. Was sung. It's called A Few Good Men by Bill Gaither. Write it down. A Few Good Men by Bill Gaither, who's a Southern Baptist, uh, Southern Gospel, you know, legend, so to speak. And this kind of touchy-feely, this kind of sissified, girly rock music. And it's not what was, we had coming up. But how did it get that way? I'll tell you how. Because a couple of big churches that I know of, for sure, start having that garbage in there. And then all the, all the people come to pastor school and they listen to that kind of garbage music. They listen to that kind of sissified, girly, twinky music. And what happens? They take it back home to their little worship leader and they get the same kind of garbage in their church. And we turn our churches into a Las Vegas nightclub where we're not praising God. Where we're not praising God in the midst of the congregation. But we're rather having somebody get up and perform the world's Las Vegas nightclub type of music. That's what happens when you get everybody yoked up together, it spreads like a cancer. And you know, young people these days, they can't even tell the difference between right music and wrong music because they grew up with their head so far in a Nintendo and their head so far in the television, they've been pumped with rock music 24 hours a day every time they go to the gas station, every time they go to the grocery store. But you know what? They, they just constantly hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, and they just can't discern the difference. Can you tell the difference, kids? Can you tell the difference between... Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And can you tell the difference between that and... Men who hate compassion, who laugh and love and cry. Men who face eternity, who are not afraid to die. Okay, can you tell the difference? One of them sounds like the Backstreet Boys. One of them sounds like the world. One of them sounds like hell. And one of them sounds like God's people. We've been influenced by the world because the devil wants to group everybody together. And that's how he attacks them. That's how he gets them. You guys like that? Huh? You want to sing that again? <laughs> You're a world leader. <laughs> but anyway, and then, and then here's the other thing you see arising. These fundamental popes across America. These guys with their churches, the big churches, and they're like the Pope of fundamentalism. You like have to go ask them before you do something. You like have to ask them before you preach or take over a church or something. No. Here's another thing. Not just the music. How about the psycho babble type preaching that's infiltrating our churches? Every church. Because I'm always trying to listen. I like to listen to preaching. Like I listen, like to listen to recorded preaching. And so I'll get on the internet. I'm searching for MP3s to download of good preaching. I'll get on the internet and uh, I'll download these services. And I feel like I literally, I wish I had a sofa because I don't have a sofa. But I wish I had a sofa so I could lie down on the sofa and listen to it. Because I'm listening to Sigmund Freud psychoanalyze me. And he's telling you, how good are your bad days? And how bad are your good days? And, and all this kind of psychology garbage. And it all goes back to when you were a kid and you are abused and all this junk. Boy, when I, was, when I was a kid, man, it was just straight out of the Bible preaching. It wasn't this kind of psycho babble. But again, 
It's because we're all linked together. It's because we're all yoked up. This thing just spreads like wildfire across churches. That's why most independent Baptist churches are part of like an independent fundamental denomination. They all believe the same thing. They all get the same orders from their fundamental pope in their area, whether it's in California or Illinois or wherever. But anyway, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.18, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. See, you can just get one bad guy at the top of these organizations. You can destroy hundreds of churches. You can destroy all kinds of churches. But there are three kingdoms that God has set up, as we said. What are they? The family, the church, and the nation. Now, this is how I picture it all the time. Who's ever played the game Pac-Man? Okay? You know Pac-Man? All right. Now, Pac-Man, this is the way I picture it. Here's the family, is this Pac-Man right here. Okay? Here's the church, is this Pac-Man right here. And here's the nation, is this bigger Pac-Man right here. And what's always constantly trying to happen throughout history? The nation is trying to usurp the authority of the church. They're trying to tell the church what they can and can't do. They're trying to tax the church. They're trying to uh, rule over the church. And then what's the church always trying to do? It's trying to rule people's homes. It's trying to go into your home and tell you what to do. And usurp your authority as a man, as a father, as a parent. And that's what's constantly happening. The struggle between these three independent kingdoms that God has set up. They're supposed to be totally separate, but constantly the power is trying to be usurped. So anyway, number one, the reason why communism is wrong is because God is not for this uniting of everybody together. Let's all yoke up. Let's all get together. Number two, God is for private property. Private property. Now let me read for you the Communist Manifesto from 1848. This is going to blow your mind. Communist Manifesto, 1848. This is totally uncensored, written by Karl Marx. Number one, the abolition of private property. He said nobody should own anything. Just private property is not allowed. Number two, heavy progressive income tax. That's what we have in this country right now, by the way. Number three, abolition of rights of inheritance. Number four, the confiscation of property rights. Number five, a central bank, which we have. Number six, government ownership of communication, government ownership of factories, government control of labor, corporate farms, and government control of education. So that was his goal. He said, I want the government to control education. I want the government to control everything. We don't want people to have individual property. Follow me. It's going to make sense in a little bit. Communist rules for revolution. This was the framework. He said, these are the eight things that we can do to bring about these goals. And tell me if these sound familiar. Number one, corrupt the young. Get them away from religion. Number two, break down the old moral values. Number three, encourage civil disorders and a soft government attitude toward crime. Remember what we were talking about this morning? These people getting let off the hook every week you hear about it in the news. Number four, divide the people into hostile groups of race, religion, etc. You know, divide people up so that they call themselves Mexican Americans and African Americans and Catholic Americans instead of just Americans. Trying to polarize people and divide up people and, and make them against one another and so forth. And then listen to this one. Number five, get the people's minds off their government by focusing their attention on athletics, sex, etc. Boy, is that what we're dealing with. He says, let's just distract people from seeing what's really going on in the world because they're so into their sports games that they're all into. They're so into their, their beer drinking sports party. They're so into their uh, just lustful appetite being fulfilled. And so we'll just take the attention off of what's really going on. Boy, tell me that's not going on. Number six, get control of the media. Number seven, destroy people's faith in their leaders. And number eight, cause the registration of all fire alarms. Oh, I'm sorry, fire alarms. My mind's on fire alarms. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> cause the registration of all firearms to eventually confiscate them. And this is what Karl Marx said. The theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence. Abolition of private property. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, if you would. Proverbs 5. I want to show you some things out of the Bible now. Proverbs chapter 5. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 15, Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. He says, look, own your own stuff. Eat off your own vine and your own fig tree. Drink out of your own well. Own your own property. That flies in the face of the communist idea of saying, 
Let's get rid of private property. And this is being brainwashed in America. Look at Barney and Friends. Yes, Barney and Friends. Caring means sharing. I don't teach my kids to share. You say, what? Yeah, this is what sharing is. You go to some playground somewhere, and two kids are playing. And, uh, you know, your kid's got their toy, and they're playing with it, you know. And then some other kid rips it out of their hand. You're like, you need to learn to share. Just let them take it. It's sharing. <laughs> no, I teach my kids to own things. I teach my kid, this is yours. This is your stuff. Don't let anybody take it away from you. But see, all these shows are just constantly brainwashing us of share, share and share alike. And it's just this communist philosophy that they're trying to give us. You say, uh, look, at the look at the parable of the talents. <clears throat> Matthew 25, I'll read this for you. Matthew 25, 28. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away that which he hath. He says, the guy who's got 10, give him 11. I want him to have abundance because he's the guy who's working hard. And hey, you wicked and slothful servant, I'm going to take your talent away and give it to him, you lazy devil. You lazy, wicked, and slothful servant. God says, you're so lazy, it's wicked. You say, it's wicked to be lazy. And it's wicked not to work. And this guy wouldn't work, he was lazy. And God said, you're wicked, you're, you're out of hell. He says, I'm going to take it away and give it to him. You say, and this is what they said. Listen to these crybabies. In Luke 19.25. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten talents. He's already got ten. Give him eleven. Because he that works and earns it should have abundance. And the guy who is lazy as the devil should have nothing. That's what God says. The Bible says even this, when we were among you, this we commanded you, that if any man would not work, neither should he eat. He says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Because you should own your own stuff, earn your own way, pay your own way, have your own property, do your own thing, and it's called capitalism, by the way. It's called capitalism when you make money and are successful and earn money for yourself, you spend it on whatever you want, you don't give it to the government, you don't give it to the guy who has no, nothing, you don't give it to some bum, you don't give it to some baby mama on welfare who's got ten kids, you keep it and you spend it. And she needs to quit being a hussy and a whore and get married and then maybe her husband can provide for her like the Bible says. Amen. God, here's God's version of utopia. You know, utopia is what the communists talk about where everything's just great. Everybody is the same. We all live in the same kind of house. We all have the same amount of money. We all drive the same cars. This is God's version of utopia. This is the, called the millennial kingdom of Christ. So discussed in Micah chapter 4. The Bible says, And he shall judge among many people, it's talking about Jesus Christ reigning on this earth, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nations, so there's peace in the world. Neither shall they learn war anymore, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. He says, this is what it's going to be in the millennium. Everybody's going to have their own everybody's going to have their own house and their own fig tree and they're going to sit out on their own private property in the millennium in God's utopia. But number three, and here's what we're dealing with. This is the big one. So number one, that was just kind of the foundation. I wanted to show you the whole philosophy of yoking people together. Let's all get together. We saw that that's wrong. We saw that that's wrong for churches, for nations. But now we're going to bring it down where we live. That was all just kind of philosophical about politics and about communism in general. Now let's bring it down where we live into our lives. This is what the philosophy of communism is. It's a, it's a philosophy that says we want to have people that specialize in certain things so that we can have maximum efficiency as opposed to just independent, self-contained, self-governing, whether it's individuals, families, churches, governments. You say, that's complicated. What are you talking about? Let me break it down for you. Here's the philosophy of, of communism. Let's take two families. Okay? Two families. Now remember, God divided families. God divided nations. Let's take two families. Let's say the McCoy family and my family. Okay? For example. And we say, listen, Brother McCoy, in order to achieve maximum efficiency, we are going to live together communally. We're going to have communism. We're going to have communal living. We're going to form a commune. It's going to be our two families joined together. Let me tell you the benefits. We only need one kitchen. Right? We, only, we can just get one big house. It's going to be cheaper than two separate houses. We can have one big kitchen. And listen, your wife cooks a lot better than my wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But your, your wife's a great cook. Let's have her cook all the food. 
Because it's so much easier just to make a double portion than two totally separate meals. So let's have your wife cook meals for both of us, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And my wife is phenomenal at doing the laundry. And so my wife is going to do all the laundry for both of us. Then she's going to be like a machine. I mean, we don't have to wait until you have a whole white load. Because you've got two families. I mean, white load is just going to be every couple of hours with, <laughs> with all our kids and everything. Every couple of hours is going to be a white load. And so let's just get her on that. Let's just have her doing that. And so we could live together. And it'd be like a communal living thing. Now, is that of God? No, that's wrong. That's communism. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where we say, let's have the person who's really good at something do it for everybody. And then they'll do it for everybody. But see, again, we're forming this network where we're all relying on other people. God says, no, just rely on God. Just rely on yourself. Live on your own. Have your own family. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. God's plan is for a man to leave his father and mother when, he, when he's a young man. You know, he grows up, and, uh, and you say, well, that's not, I'm the exception to the rule. I'm going to go live with my male roommate. No, look, God said you leave your father and mother and go to your mom and dad. I mean, I'm saying that. You leave your father and mother and you go to cleave to your wife. So kids, you want to know what God's will is for your life? Why don't you open this book and it'll tell you. It's to go from mom and dad to your wife. Or, or your husband, in, in ladies' case. I have to like clarify all these things these days. I have to be very specific. But anyhow, the point is, God wants things to be separate. He's the God of division, whether you like it or not. Look at Genesis chapter 1. The first thing God does. He creates the light, and He says, I, I divided the light and the darkness. And then he says, I'm going to create dry land. Wait, I better, di- I better divide the dry land from the sea. Oh wait, uh, the firmament? I better divide the atmosphere from the water below the firmament. It, it says over and over, God divided, God divided, God divided, God divided. That's the first chapter of the Bible. God says, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing even the dividing of the sunder. You see that? Piercing even to the dividing asunder. God is the God of division. He says, I'm going to divide between light and darkness. I divide between right and wrong. There's, there's no gray area. He says, this is how it is. There's right, there's wrong, there's heaven, there's hell. And that's all there is. That's how God is. And God divides people into families. He divides them into nations. But let's all just get together is, is, is the philosophy. Well, think about this. Well, I was thinking about this. I'm trying to, you know, save up some money to buy a swing set for my backyard. I'm trying to buy a swing set for the kids. I was going to buy one of these nice ones, the uh, the rainbows. Ever heard of the, the rainbow swing set? It's like a it's like a wooden swing set. Really nice, you know, playgrounds. Really quality stuff that lasts for years and years. It's lifetime guarantee and all this stuff. And I was just thinking about it. A lot of people would say, "Why are you buying a swing set for your backyard?" I mean, you got a swing set over there at the park for everybody. you got a swing set over there at the school for everybody to use. Why do you feel the need to have your own swing set in your backyard? Well, I'll tell you why. It, because I want to have my own swing set. But you see, why, why do I play on the government's swing set? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to play on their swing set, but it's just, uh, oh, I'm going to go play on the swing set that the government provides for my whole neighborhood. It's like, no, I want to have my own swing set. I want, to, I want to play on my own swing set in the backyard. You know, Solomon, this is the deal. He, he's memorizing the book of Ecclesiastes. And when he has the whole book of Ecclesiastes memorized, he gets the swing set. And I'm saving up for money. I think, what is he on? Almost done with chapter 2? He's got chapters 1 and 2 done. And so, we're going to get the swing set as soon as he finishes that book of the Bible. And so, that's an incentive for him. And then i got to work and make money in the meantime. And so, we can have our own swing set. Glory to God. That's called capitalism. And you, you're looking at me funny because you forgot that that's what this whole nation was all about. You know when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence? He said, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator by certain inalienable rights of which are life, liberty, and property. But what they do, they changed it. They changed it around because he wasn't the sole author. He wrote his original draft. It said life, liberty, and property. And that was the motto of the people who started this country. They had flags that said life, liberty, and property. Because the government of England was taking away their property rights. See, property, private property, is straight out of the Bible. It's straight out of the United States of America. And it's not out of hell like this communist philosophy where everybody shares. and uh, That's why I share my money with the people that are on welfare. And that's why I'm supposed to share everything. No, the difference between the Bible and communism is I can choose to say, 
I want to help somebody out. Think about this. This is the difference between communism and capitalism. I'm walking down the street with... Uh, we use Brother McCoy again. You're the communist, okay? <laughs> come on up here, communist. <laughs> come, on up, come on up here, uh, Vladimir Lenin, okay? <laughs> so me and Lenin are walking down the street here. And uh, we, we walk up to this, this, mo- this, this single mother with these, three kids, with these three kids, okay? And uh, she's starving to death. She's getting kicked out of her place, right? Well, here's capitalism. Here's godliness. Here's charity, as the Bible uses the word charity. Here is what God talks about in the book of Acts and so forth. I walk up and I say, you know what, Lenin? I think I'm going to help this woman out. You know, I'm going to do it. I need this. I need this back. I need this. I need this Washington back after the service. All right. <laughs> hey. So I give her that money, right? Now listen. By doing that, now I feel love toward this person that I just helped. Because you'll find that uh, when you do something for someone else, you will love that person. The Bible says, "For God so loved the world that He gave." And so when I when I come to her and I say, "Here, let me help you out." Now I feel love toward her. Man, I really helped her out. I hope she's doing better next month. You know, I hope next time I come by she's doing better. I hope that helped her out a little bit. I hope her kids are, are fed tonight. And boy, you know, I want to help out my fellow man. And, and there's a real, and then she's real thankful. Because she knows that I just pulled out my hard-earned money and gave it to her. And there's a mutual love there. You see that? Now, here's the communist philosophy. Okay. So, uh, Lenine and I are walking down the street here. I don't even have a good name like that. <laughs> okay, so Lenin and I are walking down the street, and uh, and he says to me, he says, you know what, Brother Anderson, this woman is really in a bad shape here. Look at these kids and everything, and they're unkempt. Uh, hand me your wallet. And I say, uh, okay. <laughs> and he takes my wallet, and he takes money out of my wallet and gives it to her, and then gives me my wallet back. And I'm thinking to myself. Did you just take money out of my wallet? Did you just give her money? <laughs> what? Now, pretty soon, I'm mad at her. Because what's she doing with my money? And what are you doing taking my money? And, and she doesn't love me because she doesn't even know that I'm the one that provided the money. She doesn't even care about me. This is, that's, that's liberalism and conservatism. Conservatism says, I'm going to help somebody out if I want to. And I'm, God's commanding me to help people out. So I'm going to help them out. I'm going to do good to my brother, especially them of the household of faith. But see, liberalism says, I'm going to steal something that belongs to someone else and give it to the poor. And that's how I show charity. By taking something out of somebody else's paycheck against their will and giving it to the person that's hard up and good. Sit down. Communist devil. (laughs) But anyway, do you see that? That's the difference between godly charity and between communism. But you see, here's what I have against Christian schools. It's the same thing. This is, this, is what, this is what the Christian school movement is. The Christian fool movement, as I call it. The Christian fool movement says, let's find one person who's the best teacher who can raise kids better than we can raise kids. We'll find this great person to raise kids and we'll have them raise all our kids. Like one big happy family. And they will raise all of our kids and we won't even have to worry about it. And they'll turn out right because we sent them to the Christian school. That's what's wrong with the Christian school movement. That's why we used to have a great big revivals in this country and independent fundamental Baptist churches booming. And then all of a sudden, what happened? Boom, Christian school movement, late 60s, early 70s. Christian schools were invented. By the way, they didn't even exist before that. There was no such thing as a Christian school before the late 60s. There were public schools. And here's what happened. You got the Christian school movement. Now, I'm putting my kid... You got got families that are... uh, very godly families. you got families that are not so godly and you got everything in between. We put all our kids together and guess what happens? They all get homogenized to the lowest common denominator. That's what the Bible said. One sinner destroys much good. So, I've got my son here, Isaac. Come here, Isaac. He's all kinds of illustrations tonight. i got my son, Isaac. And I say, listen, Isaac. You're not, you're not going to watch Spongebob. Look at me. You're not going to watch Spider-Man. You're not going to watch the, the, uh, all the videos and the Hollywood and all that garbage. And uh, you don't, you, we don't even have a television. And so I want you to uh, memorize the book of Ecclesiastes. And I want you to learn the Bible. And, and we're going to have good, clean fun. We're going to go places and have a great time. But we're not going to participate in worldly, kind of ungodly stuff. We're not going to do it, okay? Alright. 
Now he understands that and he, and he loves me and we get along great. But what happens? He turns five. The first day of school, he learns about Spongebob. The first day of school, he learns about Spider-Man. The first day of school, he learns about all the worldly stuff. Now let me tell you something. I'm going I'm to be a little bit personal right now. And I'm going to tell you something. I grew up in Christian school. Now I've been to public school for a few years, the last two years of my schooling. And I went to public school for sixth grade. And I've been homeschooled. And I've been in Christian school. I've been in eight different Christian schools growing up. Because we moved different times and churches went liberal and everything. And let me tell you about my experiences in the Christian school. When I was seven years old, and I'm gonna, I can't even be graphic enough to tell you the real truth about what went on. But I'll just give you just the tip of the iceberg. When I was seven years old, in the third grade, I was a year ahead from my age. I was exposed to the birds and the bees from some filthy, perverted kid on the playground telling me about snuff porn. Telling me about violent pornography. And I'm not going to go any further than that. Explaining to me in detail the filthiest, most vile pornography imaginable to the human mind that he had gotten from some relative or he'd gotten from his dad. And he explained to me, that's where I learned about the birds and the bees, from some filthy pervert on the playground explaining that to me at seven years of old in a Christian school. Then, when I was in 4th and 5th grade, I got exposed to all the same filth. We, we, all the kids in the Christian school that I went to, and this was a local church, independent, fundamental Baptist church. All the kids would do, they'd go to the library of the church, and they would get all the National Geographic magazines, which I like to call National Pornographic, and they would take down the National Pornographic magazines, and they'd say, hey, check out March 1984, page 85, and they had the whole library mes- me- memorize where all the nude pictures were. All the nudity was, and they passed those around. They had conversations. They had long, drawn-out conversations. Let's move forward to seventh grade. They had long, drawn-out conversations. This independent, fundamental, Baptist Christian school about who they would and would not want to commit fornication with. Let's just put it that way. Just, that's what they talk about for hours. Just sit down and talk about it. Just the filth and the vile ungodliness. Then let's move to 8th grade. When I was in 8th grade, pornographic videotapes being passed around to every kid in the class. Then half the class got suspended for smoking marijuana. Christian school. Fundamental. King James Bible. It's called reality. Welcome to reality. Come to reality. Because what happens? you got one sinner in there. I remember in 8th grade, there was one particular kid that brought all the drugs... He brought all the pornography. He brought everything. And these young kids do, just do not have the fortitude to, uh, to fight against it. They just don't have the gumption to, to say no to this stuff. It's shoved down their throat. Oh, when I was in 7th grade, people, uh, homosexual advances made by older students on younger students that I saw happen. And I'm talking about a 12th grader and like a, uh, abusing a 9th grader. That I saw going on. I saw all kinds. I mean, I, I hesitate to even mention any of it because it's just so vile and filthy. But I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Is that that's what goes on. Because whenever you put a bunch of people together and have one big happy family and say, we're not going to have mom and dad raise their own kids. We're going to all put them together and have their, this one mom raise all the kids. And it's always, it's always women. Show me a... Hey, I'll challenge you. I'll, I'll give you $1,000 cash. If you can show me a Christian school across America staffed by men. Show me. All men. I mean men teachers. And the Bible says that women are supposed to be marry, bear children, guide the house. It says they're supposed to be keepers at home. It's supposed to marry, bear children, guide the house. It's supposed to get married and have kids. That's supposed to be teaching in some Christian school while their kids in daycare. Watching Sesame Street and Spongebob and Barney and Friends. Learning how to share and be a communist. And so here's what they do. They, they, they leave the kid at daycare. And they go raise somebody else's kids all day in a Christian school. And so little Johnny goes to a Christian school, right? So he's learning the Bible from some woman who's on birth control pills out the wazoo, taking a bunch of male hormones. And then she's uh, left her own kids in daycare and she's up there teaching them the Word of God when the Bible says that women are not supposed to teach the Word of God. It's men that are supposed to be teaching the Word of God. And so what happens? Little Johnny gets some little sissified Christianity. And then, and then we sing the Star Spangled Banner in church, and little Johnny is getting a weird look on his face, because verse number 3 says, And where is that band who so vauntingly swore, and, and uh, their blood hath washed out their foul footsteps pollution? And they're like, what? Yeah, that's graphic. You know, hey, that's America. That's, that's, that's a song about God. A song about Jesus Christ. A song about God is our, and God is our trust. 
And see, we've turned out this wimpy, sissified Christianity out of the Christian school. I knew a guy, I had a friend, I have a great friend, and I said to him, I said, how's so-and-so doing? One of his converts, a girl that he won to the Lord and, and discipled this girl. He said, man, she was doing great until she went to the Christian school and they ruined her. Now she's a liberal compromiser like all the rest of the kids. She used to be fundamental. She used to be soul winning. Now she's compromised on everything and she's going to such and such liberal Bible college like all the other kids are going to. He's like, they ruined my convert. Because they sent her in there and she just came out with the least common denominator. Listen to me, kids. No Christian school is going to make you turn out right. I don't know. Just out of curiosity, how many kids here go to public school? You go to, pu- you go to public school, right? Don't be shy. Put the hand up. All right. Public school. Okay. Look, here's the thing. Public school is not going to make you turn out wrong. I'll tell you that right now. I, I went to public school for junior and senior year high school. You know what I did? I brought my Bible to school. And I laid it on the table. Because here's the thing. Teenagers like to be rebellious, don't they? Don't teenagers like to be rebellious? Well, guess what? I went to, the Christ- I went to the public school, and you know what I did? I rebelled against their ungodliness. And I went there, I raised my hand in class and preached to them. I slapped my Bible on the table, I put it on the top of my books, and I brought it to school every day. Nobody can stop you from doing that. So don't, don't ever use that as an excuse. You can be in that public school, and you can live for God. Because guess what? Everybody in the Bible who lived for God, and everybody who ever will live for God, they did it alone by themselves. God said, I sought for a man. He didn't say, I sought for a, a, a group of people. I sought for the crowd. He says, no, I sought for a man to stand, in the, to stand in the gap and make up the hedge before me for my people. And see, God has always been the God who uses the individual, not the group. See, that's what communism is. Let's all get together in groups. Let's all work together. Let's all combine our resources. Let's erase the lines of the family. Let's erase the lines of the nations and just call it the Soviet Union. Let's erase the lines between Mexico and America and let the immigrants flood in all they want because we're going to separate. The, we're not going to separate the nations. We're not going to separate families. We're not going to separate churches. Separation is of God. And I'm going to tell you something. God has never used the crowd. In the Christian school, the in crowd, the popular crowd, the crowd that everybody said loved God, that were the the spiritual crowd, they're all living like hell right now. I'll tell you that right now. And me, who was who was not in the in the, the spiritual crowd, so to speak, I wasn't considered the, the spiritual kid. You know, I was just considered more the the rebellious punk. Here I am, a soul winner. Here I am, living for God. Here I am, I love the Bible because it's not about some crowd. It's not some crowd. It's about you. And you, and you, and you, and you. It's about the individual. God says, I'll take one man and cause 10,000 to flee before him. He says, I'll take one man and turn a nation upside down. I'll take 12 men, the 12 disciples, and I'll use them to preach the gospel to the entire world. 12 men. He said, oh, the multitudes are thronging to me, but I'm going to send them away. As we saw in Matthew chapter 5, beginning of chapter 5. He said, the multitude is wrong to me. I'm going to send them away. I'm going to go up into the mountain and bring my disciples. Because that's who I'm training. That's what I'm trying to teach. Just these 12 people. Because these 12 people are the ones who are going to turn the world upside down. Not the crowd. Not the sheep. Not the followers. He said, no, these people are like sheep without a shepherd. He says, I'm looking for somebody who's on fire for God. I'm looking for one person who will live for God. That's what I love about the King James Bible. Because you can only read the King James Bible and get the these and the thous. I love the these and the thous. You know why? Because thee and thou is singular. One person. Ye and you is plural. You notice in the Bible what God is constantly saying? Thou, 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 thou. Deuteronomy chapter 6, he's talking about teaching your children the word of God. Thou shalt teach them to thy children. Not put your kid in daycare and teach it to everybody's children. Thou teach them to thy children. And God says, thou, thou. And you know who the first person in the Bible who uses the word ye? First person to use the word you in the Bible? The devil. The devil in Genesis 7-3 says, ye shall not surely die. So, and that's why the devil's Bible, the NIV and all these other Bibles, you, 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 you. It takes the personal touch where you can tell the difference when God's talking to everybody and when God's talking to you. And I want to tell you something. If you want to live for God, you can't. And it's not going to be because your youth group lives for God. It's not going to be because your church lives for God. It's not going to be because the crowd lives for God. It's not going to be because your school taught you to live for God. It's going to be because you decide that I am
I'm going to read this book and I'm going to meditate on this book day and night. I'm going to refuse all the world's garbage and I'm going to make this book everything to me and I am going to be what God wants me to be and I'm going to preach the gospel to every creature and I'm going to fight the Lord's battles and I am going to do it alone with Jesus Christ and me and that's it. That's the way it is. You stand before God alone. When you pray, it's alone, God said. God said the most important prayer is when you go in the closet and shut the door and lock it. And it's just you and God and you get on your face and pray. The most important time when you're learning the Bible is when you personally are reading it yourself. Not relying on some preacher. I'm, uh, half of what I'm saying to you is garbage anyway. <laughs> you can't believe what I'm saying. How do you know what I'm telling you the truth if you don't read this book and figure it out for yourself? And that's what God is saying. You need to read it yourself. Don't rely on some church to spoon feed you. Don't rely on some Christian school to raise your kids. Don't rely on the government to pay your bills. Pay your own bills. Live for God yourself. Walk with God yourself. Love God yourself. Win souls yourself. Come to church because you come to church because it's you that made that decision to come to church. Obviously, parents force your kids to come to church. But kids, your parents can force you to come to church. But you know what? When you grow up someday, you're going to have to decide, I'm going to go to church. And I'm not going to go to some liberal pansy church where I'm not even sure whether the, the song leader is straight or not. I'm going to go to a church that's on fire for God, that loves God, that preaches the truth, that preaches His book, that wins souls, that baptizes converts. Hey, I'm going to go to a church that's like God's kind of church. You're not going to know what's God's kind of church if you don't read this book right here. The only way to find out what God's kind of church is, is to read this book. Because you're going to find out in this book is... It, I was talking to Amanda. She said, you know what? I, I, I said, what are your comments? Because she read through the whole Bible cover to cover in the last, what, five months? And I said, what are your comments? I said, do you have any just final summary statements? Just what did you discover? You know, I mean, it's just interesting to me. Somebody reading the Bible for the first time just cover to cover. And I remember the, the observations that I made when I read it the first time cover to cover when I was 17. And she said, here's what I discovered. What everybody else thinks and these churches and stuff, their view of God is a little bit different than the God of the Bible. Is that right? It's a little bit different. Very, much so. very, very different. Okay, Because people have just been spoon-fed by their little liberal Sunday school teacher. They've just been spoon-fed what everybody wants to read. Hey, this church is not a spoon-fed. This is like a self-serve. Okay, You come here and you get your tray and we'll serve it up. Let me tell you, we'll serve it up hot and, 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 uh, and we'll, <laughs> we'll serve it up. It's going to be messy. It's going to be everywhere. And you, but you get the ladle yourself and you serve it up yourself. This isn't some, this is like, this is like have it your way. You know, this is like uh, serve yourself. This is like a cafeteria where you get the tray and you get it yourself. And look, don't, don't rely on me to feed you. Don't rely on me to teach you the Bible. I'll do the best I can to preach the Bible and teach it. I can't do it. You need to do it. You need to, I mean, imagine, imagine uh, Brother McCoy, <laughs> again, <laughs> hey, what if I put Brother McCoy up here and put him in a high chair and start feeding him, <laughs> and I start, and I start feeding him like, uh, what's that, uh, it's always this weird stuff, but squash or something, you know, you know, the baby food, it's always this weird stuff that, that adults never eat, you know, it's like <laughs> boiled squash, what is it, what's the other one that's real weird? I don't know, but anyway, it's like beets, you know, I got my beets, my ground up beets, right, and I set him up, and I put a, a bib on Brother McCoy, and just start spoon feeding him beets, that'd be the most <laughs> stupid, ridiculous thing you can imagine, you think Brother McCoy wants to eat beets right now, he wants to eat a T-bone steak right now, he's not eat some beet, he's not eat uh, mashed up, and it's these combinations, Squash combined with plums. You know, it's ground up. I don't know. There, I just remember when I was in the baby food aisle. It looked pretty weird, some of the combinations. And so, uh, imagine me feeding him this soft, sissy stuff, and I'm putting it in his mouth, and it's falling everywhere, and I'm wiping his mouth. Look, he's a grown man. Wouldn't you expect him to feed himself? Wouldn't you expect him to go home and read the King James Bible himself, and pick it up and read it, and not just expect somebody to spoon feed him three times a week? No, I expect Brother McCoy to go home and pick up his Bible and read it for himself because he's a grown man. Well, it's time for us as Christians to grow up. Hey, kids, it's time to grow up. Hey, adults, it's time to grow up and read this book yourself because it's the individual relationship with God. It's your individual walk with God. It's your individual calling from God. And see, that's the only way 
we're going to get this nation right, that's the only way great churches are going to be built, is when people say, I'm not just going to put my kids into some machine where uh, this, is the, this is the machine, and in the top I drop my uh, 13-year-old child, and then it goes through the little machine of the four years of high school and the four years of Bible college, and then poof, out comes a Christian out of the machine. It's not what comes out of the machine. You know what comes out of the machine? A bunch of liberals. A bunch of people who don't have any grit in their craw. A bunch of sissies. A bunch of guys who wear pink shirts to Bible college. A bunch of guys with their little sissified little hairdo that's, that's got the little poof in the front like the Backstreet Boys. They got their little tailored shirts that's tailored like a woman's shirt. And so it kind of, it's real tight on them and goes in right here. They got the little tight pants on. <laughs> I remember when I was in Bible college, I kid you not. When I was in Bible college... There were, I seen a guy that had a he had a pattern on his shirt like a woman's blouse. Okay, I'm talking about like uh, just a very purple and this all this real. It was like it was a blouse. If it wasn't a blouse, then I'm a monkey's uncle. And like <laughs> on the side of the on the side of the sleeves, it literally had this little triangle taken out. You know, like a woman's blouse has, where the sleeves are real tight and it has a little triangle. Who knows what I'm talking about? And there's a little triangle. All the women are raising hands. They know what they're, they know what I'm talking about. But it had a little triangle, a little shape cut out. And uh, that's that's what comes out of the machine, friend. Because <laughs> otherwise, this this nation wouldn't be in the shape it's in. Otherwise, there'd be all these. Where are all these fiery fundamental Baptist preachers coming out of these Bible colleges? Where are they? Huh? Where are they? No, I don't see it. I see a bunch of liberals coming out that look exactly like New Evangelicals. Their music's like the New Evangelicals. They're liberal like the New Evangelicals. They don't knock doors. They don't preach the gospel. They don't preach controversial sermons. They don't get mad and scream and yell and holler in the pulpit. They preach a bunch of psychology. And I'm telling you something. You can't put your kids in a machine and have them come out. You need to get on your face and beg God that your kids turn out right. You need to say, listen, I'm not going to rely on the Sunday school teacher to teach you the Word of God. I'm dad. I'm going to teach you the Word of God myself. You're the one that needs to teach your kids the Word of God. Don't rely on somebody else to do it. You must do it. I must do it. You must do it. Every man needs to bear rule in his own house, the Bible says, and needs to say, let me teach you the Word of God. I know your Sunday school teaches you. I know, I know that the preacher teaches you at church, but I'm your dad, I'm your mom, and I'm not going to rely on somebody else. I'm not going to roll the dice that my kids turn out right. I am going to teach it to you myself. Because I'm going to make sure you learn it. And that's the only way that I know that you're getting it, is when I teach it to you yourself. And I sit you down and say, listen, son... You can't be like everybody else. You've got to be like God told you to be. You've got to walk with God yourself. There's no machine. It's just laziness where you say, oh, let's put them in the machine and, and watch them come out for God. They don't come out for God. They come out of Christian school for God. No Christian school is going to raise anybody for God. No Bible college is going to turn anybody to God. A person is going to turn to God when they get this book right here and they get the Word of God and they're alone with God. And it's just them and God. That's how it works. Anyway, I had a lot more in my sermon. I had this elaborate sermon about communism, and it was great, but I only got to like one page of it. <laughs> anyway, you get the point of the sermon. God's, God's plan is not this big yoked up union where all the churches get together and we all work together. And I've heard all these Baptists say, like, if we just all get together, we'd see the world saved. If we could all just work together and pull on the same rope. Now, you know what would get the world saved? You know what, you know what would do it? If we just had 12 people in this country that were on fire for God. If we just had 12 people in this country who were filled with the Holy Ghost. If we just had 12 people in this country who were full of this book and not full of all the world's garbage and television and rock music and television and all that garbage. But if they just said, this book is my God and I'm going to just do everything I can to win as many people to Christ as I can. I'm going to read this book day and night. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And I am going to turn this world upside down for God. And I'm going to see what God can do. That's what we need. Just like 12 people. We don't need some Billy Graham crusade. We need like 12 people who want to preach the gospel. That's what we need. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Father, just thank you so much for the Word of God and not really a uh, 